if you are looking at going to South America on your motorcycle and you live in North America, you have no excuse. Here's how you do it. Go out your front door, start your bike, head south. It's simple as that. If you live in Europe, do the same and you can do the same to Africa. And you are laughing at me and you're saying, oh yeah, you're privileged, you have a lot of money, this and that. I tell you, anybody can do it. It's all up in your head. Welcome to Motortrack. I'm Helge Pedersen, and in 1985, I traveled with this cargo ship all the way from Oslo to Buenos Aires. Came to Buenos Aires in the fall of 1985 and headed straight down to Ushuaia. Since my first trip to Latin America, I've been back several times. I've ridden Central America, down the Pan American Highway. I've been in Ushuaia five times now. It's kind of funny to see the picture from the first to the last time, but these times I've done it leading tours. If you want to see Patagonia, sit down and it will all blow by you. I was sitting there on my bike and just hanging on for my life. But I finally made it down to Ushuaia and everything changed. Mountains, beautiful pine forests, lakes, and I happened to got a job. And the reason I was looking for a job was I want to learn some language. I was very lucky because I got to work with Mario and Graciela, and we were clearing a path up to Lago Fangano, and we ended up staying there for two months. It was tough. It was summer, January. I mean, we wake up to like an inch, an inch and a half of snow in the morning. But the biggest problem we had we worked our way up and we used up all the food we had. I was so starved after that experience. I've never been that starved in my life. But what an experience it was. Ushuaia for that reason is a very, very special place. And I've been back many times later and I love it. So when you travel in Patagonia, you have to go on a Ruta Cuarenta and it's infamous for its brutal gravel roads. It was tough. With the Patagonia wind, and you are going in this deep rutted uh, gravel, and the worst is usually when you have a grader coming through, because then it's extra deep, and you're just dancing there and hanging on, plus you got the wind, and then you meet a truck, and it's like, usually I would then just stop and park myself and head on after. In Patagonia, you have to go and see Mount Fitzroy. Came there, parked my bike, put up my tent, couldn't see it, couldn't see it. Three days went by and I said, okay, enough is enough. It was just caked in in fog. So the following day, I was gonna take off and just forget about it, were kind of disappointed, really had looked forward to it. Look out my tent, I couldn't believe it. It felt like I was right at the foothill and there is this majestic mountain just reaching for the heavens. It's just a, like a rocket. When you travel, the best currency you can have with you is time. Don't let time press you out of a situation that could be a beautiful experience. Take your time. When I came to the border towards Peru, instead of crossing at the seaside, I headed up the hill. And I tell you, that's a steep hill. Olga, my bike, was like, ugh. This is getting very tiresome now. It was just, I lost one horsepower, two horsepower, three horsepower. It was really weird because as I climbed up, I could see the horses falling out of the engine, <laughs> kind of. It's just less oxygen and I need to stop and change my main jet in the carburetor. In other words, give the engine less gasoline so it would more proportion to the amount of oxygen that was in the air that came in to feed the engine. I stopped at a little cafe and I'm not kidding, it was three or four steps into the cafe and I'm almost fainted. I felt, ooh, there's not much oxygen up here. It took two or three days and started to get back to normal, but in the beginning there, it was more brutal than on me than on the bike. You will find yourself on sea level one day and then all of a sudden you are up to 14, 15, 16,000 feet and you feel it on your body and you have to prepare. And the best thing you can do, sorry to say, 
but no alcohol. You need to hydrate and alcohol is not good for that even though you think so. And the best is to take it slowly going up and rest. I met some journalists uh, in Lima, Peru. And I always like to meet these people because I learn so much and they can tell me stories. And they were talking, so Helge, going through the Darien Gap, how are you going to do that one? I said, what do you mean? I don't even know what it is. Oh no, it's the missing link between Panama and Colombia. They showed me an article about the Lipton expedition. They interviewed them when they came down to Lima after going through successfully. They used several years for that, a lot of money. So I thought, wow, that sounds like fun. And I really had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> so when I come up to Colombia, I looked into alternatives. Well, I could fly over or I could take a boat around. But flying or taking a boat would cost money. And I was on a strict budget. So I thought, well, if they can take a Jeep to it, darn it, I can take my bike. I met this beautiful girl at the bar and she said, oh, you need to meet this guy. He guided tours through the gap and he'd done it uh, several times. You need to talk to him. So I met him, we sat down, we talked about the route and made sketches and stuff. And at the same time, I met the miserable German guy, Joachim Quernheim. He'd been robbed in Colombia. He lost a lot of money with some police affair in Venezuela. And he just had, had so bad luck on his travels. He was a backpacker. So I convinced him to go with me into the jungle and Without him, I could never have made it. We got supplies, we got 40 meters of rope, pulleys, and we were going to follow Rio Tule, and we were going to cross it eight times. In other words, it goes in zigzag and you go over like this, and it was tough. It was really tough going. One of the first big hills, first we go with Manchete, cut up, make it clear. Then I start the bike and ride up, and I was going a little too hot into it. Popped the wheelie, lost totally the bike, threw it to the side because I didn't want to be crushed, and my hand went right on the rock. So you still have the brake here. Fortunately for me, I didn't know I'd broken my hand, but it hurt like really bad, and it was swollen up. I couldn't even take my glove on. I just had to endure it, got used to the pain. Every day we woke up early in the morning, cut the trail, Sometimes we were not sure where the walking trail were because this is a seasonal trail, you have to remember. The Kuna Indians and Ambara Indians go through there and they cut the trails. So we had to track that down. A big tree fall over. We have to use the manchette, cut, get the bike over, carry the luggage. It's like clearing that path, 300 yards, riding it or walking it. And then we come to a steep hill go as far up as you can, I just threw it down, and then we take a rope, secure it, use the pulleys with the rope, get it up like that. It took hours to get up some of these hills. We were totally exhausted. And the engine was exhausted. I actually got what we call, I learned later, vapor lock. It got so hot that the gasoline was just boiling in the carburetors and it wouldn't run. And I was afraid of losing my battery, so I used the Kickstarter and eventually I also took out the air filter so it could cool the whole system a little better. And that's the only way I could ride the bike without the air filter and just kickstarting it every time I need to start it. And then we got attacked by bees, African killer bees. And they are very tutorial. So when you start cutting, they will just come for you. You stop. Sometimes we could sit and eat and we were peaceful. They come and check you out. They wouldn't bite you or sting you, but they would just be all over. Sometimes I couldn't see my arm or eating, kind of had to brush them away. It was like a psychological mind game. Then we take up a little root of a scorpion under there. So you had to be careful with that. But perhaps the worst of all was the ticks. We go all day working, got ticks on us probably all day. And then at night we were sitting there like monkeys, you know, picking off the ticks. And one day we counted, I think it was 156 or something. 
that uh, Joachim have picked off. And in the morning, you will discover more that gone in your groin or under your arms, and it was full of blood. And that's how I got the infection in my legs too. So as you understand, it was no picnic. It was tough going, and eventually we ran out of food. We had been in the jungle now since we left Turbo, which was the last village or city in uh, Colombia. And we were almost at the Kuna village in Panama. We come to the border, no border crossing, just a little plaque said that we were entering Colombia, no people, two weeks we didn't see people. And then we had to leave the bike because the three weeks supply of food had been eaten up in two weeks because we were just burning it up. We were working like crazy to get this darn bike there. So we got into uh, Paya, nice to see people and we could eat all we wanted. And then we went back, got the bike, and the last part of it was much, much easier because now we were around people, we got help from people, and we got down to what they call Yavisa, and then we were back on the Pan American Highway and could continue into Panama City. The whole trip through the Darien Gap, 80 miles, took 20 days. Two weeks of 14 days, we didn't see anybody else. We were just by ourselves struggling to get through. I'd come to Panama City, went to the doctor. He confirmed I'd broken my arm, broken my ribs. But the worst was the infection in the leg. He said, you need some uh, antibiotics here. So he sent me to the pharmacy. And this big lady shot it in my buttocks in the morning. And I had a nightmare about her every night. For 10 days I had that and eventually my legs that was just full of uh, infection came down to its normal size again. I could continue my travels. If you are looking at going to South America on your motorcycle and you live in North America, you have no excuse. Here's how you do it. Go out your front door, put the key or your fob, start your bike, head south. It's simple as that. And you are laughing at me and you're saying, oh yeah, you're privileged, you have a lot of money, this and that. I tell you, anybody can do it. You can take a street bike, go all the way to Ushuaia. It's not about the money. Sure, you have to have some money. I took off from Norway with $2,300 to my name. I was gone for two years. And then I continued for eight more years after that. I made money on the way. I wrote articles, sold them to magazines. It's about your attitude. It's about your creativity and trust in yourself that you can find something. You might be a programmer. You might be able to film and do some videoing. You go to a hotel, say, hey, your website really looked terrible. I can help you and make a deal with them. Continue like that. You get so much more out of it than just having a lot of money and just passing by and taking a picture here and there. You embed yourself in the culture by being there. So many people are hooked up and that big bank account you have to have to do all of these things. It's all up in your head. 